Hello and a very to the Bar Stewards Inquiry weekend podcast. Uh, my name's Lee Keys from systembet.co.uk and my partner in crime, as always, is John Leng of John Joe's Blogspot on Facebook. Give that to uh, that group a watch. I can I can assure you, you will be entertained. And also, uh, John made a substantial profit last season on his selections, which you might want to uh, check out. Like I say, it's, it's a lot of fun, and um, and there's no no fees or anything like that. It's it's all good fun. Uh, right onto the um, uh, the show. Um, we've not got many questions this week, so we'll zip through the questions. Um, First question uh, was from a, a regular listener of ours, uh, Lorne uh, Malver on the, uh, uh, Twitter. And uh, his question is, do you think that training racehorses is far easier in reality than portrayed by the media? And he makes an example saying that there are several highly successful ground trainers who enjoyed successful careers in other professions. Is this because training dogs is easier or could they do the same with horses? And who better to ask the new job? You've got years of experience with uh, Sir Michael Stout, um, etc. Um, what, 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 uh, what do you think to that? I think probably at the high end it's a little bit tricky because year in year out you see what what you might call lesser trainers maybe get lucky and they pop on the scene with something that you give it half a chance to win a classic and somewhere deep down you know they're going to spanner it up at some point, you know. Um, yeah. But I think you, you run of the mill day in, day out stuff, you know. I mean, a lot of it is just mind-numbing routine, really, you know. I mean, you'll, um, you'll start your cantering, you'll maybe do a month's cantering, um, you bring them into work, slowly, gradually, you know what I mean, you'll build up and then you'll start doing maybe six and a two or something like that if you're working about a mile. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it, it, there is a sort of a blueprint, if you like, just for, for bringing, them along, bringing them along, getting them to concert pitch. And as I say, it's just really when you're looking to get that bit extra out of them when the when they're telling you that they ready to go up in class and things like that, you know, I think that's where what separates the men from the boys, you know, that yeah. the, the top lads can probably get in their heads a bit as well, you know. Um, <coughs> do you, have a better, do you, better idea when they're ready for stepping up, you know. Yeah. Do, do you think, do you think like, like the top traders, for example, um, they... Or, or they may know how to train certain horses differently, perhaps <coughs> than than say than, than say your average run of the mill trainer on the same feed, you know the same sort of gallops. They've got they've got the same uh, facilities in their yards, but yet certain trainers appear just that bit better than others. Uh, do, do you think think that think that could be like gallops knowledge is of... certainly orchestrated differently? You know, I mean, you know yourself, like you yeah. you'll go and. Uh, Say, shall we say middle of the road trainer and the whole string will go out for a second lot or whatever and they'll all go three quarter speed up to six fair long gallop. Yeah. Every single one of them, you know. Whereas your top trainers will consider like each group of horses that will come up with gallop, what's gonna lead, what sort of speed they'll go. They tend to go six to seven furlongs, you know, so they'd maybe say you do a five and a two. When you say a five and a two, that'd be like a five half speed quickening for the last two. And all the time you, you're looking to get that speed into them at the end, you know, and educating them to quicken. Yeah. You know, you want them to settle at first and then quicken when you go for them. Um, and I think that'd be the glaring difference, you know, they probably give an awful lot more consideration to the the work that they're going to do with them. And I think that that work then tends to be more valuable, you know? Yeah. I mean, watching a Cricky Ed um, uh, documentary, uh, I think it was on Racing TV once, and they, they interviewed Cricky Head, and um, 
and I, and I found her techniques fascinating because obviously that it's something. I mean, apparently they did, they didn't put coats on them in the winter. I'm I'm not sure I agree with that bit, but you know, like when it got cold, they didn't they didn't they didn't model the cuddle them. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. um, and the the gallops were basically <laughs> absolutely totally cantering and breezing, and yeah. literally quick quickening quickening up for two furlongs at maximum pace. Mm. And then and then easing off and 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 she argued that basically uh, races were just won and lost by the ability to quicken, which because yeah. mo- her argument was that most horses can sustain a galloping speed because they bred to do it, they bred yeah. they bred to gallop, and so most horses can gallop sort of thirty eight miles an hour constantly, um, but can can they you know the the special ones tend to be able to. Just, you know, that's it. That's why your factory will just churn them out, you know. And yeah, we'll build the two pieces of work away, six for as long as we'll do it three quarters spade, and, and that'll be it, you know. And then we just keep going and put the plateau out, you know. Uh, whereas the other ones, you're not overtaxing them on the work, you know. Yeah. They're probably only really putting maximum effort in the last two furlongs, and uh. I mean, just about all the all the top trainers that don't know anything about the training routines have always looked to have horses quickening at the end of a gallop, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously the obvious things like, like you said, routines. Um, you know, uh, the, the getting up, feeding at the at the right time in the morning. Every, everything's done to time. Wash downs. Every, everything's a routine with horses, and. And I think that's part of it. Good feed, um, you know, bit I of juice. As well with experience, <laughs> well Lee, you know, I mean, um, I mean, there'll be certain trainers that if they think they've got an Epsom horse, they'll follow the set pattern, you know. I mean, they might like Chester, they might like York, Sandown, whatever, you know, but they'll more or less have it mapped out how, how they're going to, plot the route to Epsom, you know, because they'll say, well, he'll need to be a bit further on if he's going to go uh, the Dampy than he would be if we, if we start off in the classic trial at Sandown. Yeah. You know, so they, you'd maybe send him to Sandown, I don't know, you share a 90%, you know, leave a bit of improvement on him, um, ride him to finish the race off well. You, you know you're going to get over the 10% out of him at York. You know, and from past experience, if you've gone the same route with other horses, you know more or less exactly how much work to give him in between as well, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, so in a, in, in a broad answer to the question then, uh, I mean, that's what I think, that <clears throat> I, I don't think it's an easy, easy profession to do. I think, I, you know, I think that there's... I think the best ones will be the ones that are able to apply the attention to detail, i.e. mapping out a horse's career for starters and, and, and where you want to be with this. If, if you've got an 80 horse, then try and get it rated 65 or 60. Um, if you've got a, a, a group horse, then, you know, like you said, map, map out your plan to where you want that horse to end up. And, and I think that's, that's how you should work them. You should, uh, identify if they can quicken up if they can't if they're just basically a galloper lots of things i think and i think the best trainers have that real attention to detail that maybe um like you know lesser ones that just just don't have, have, have that have that skill so that's what i'd say would you agree with that john yeah i would i think some trainers can sort of look at the at the start of its three-year-old career and sort of envisage what's, what it's going to look like in the middle of the next year, you know, um, where it needs to thicken up, sort the condition it needs to put on, um, you, you know, and they can sort of tailor the work to gear towards getting that horse into that kind of shape, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, good question, Lon. Uh, thanks for that. Um, second question this week and final one is what's uh, boys, what's the uh, Cheltenham handicap nap? Uh, John, have you got uh, any Cheltenham handicappers that uh, you quite like? It's fairly early days at the minute because running plans are very fluid. Um, but 
one one half hour included in a multiple bet at the moment is uh, blow lard of uh, Willie Mullins's. Um, I think this is a fairly useful novice. Um, I think that the mat probably doesn't quite do it justice. And uh, I've actually shoved that in an H way lucky 31 that I've got running. Um, and uh, the target would hopefully be the county hurdle. Interesting. Um, I took 8 to 1 that one in, uh, in my multiple bets, non running no bet. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that's it. A reasonable starting point. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't gone mad on the, the handicaps by any stretch at the minute. Um, I, I, w- I will be probably looking for a life change in sixty-three or something at the at the start of the week. I would imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, as, as we are, will. <laughs> as, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Blue Lord I see is obviously being be entered in the novice races. You'd hope. That connections will look at that handicap mark, which I, I do agree with you. I think you've, I think you have got a well handicapped hurdler because I think there's more, a lot more to come. Um, whereas running sort of sixth in a supreme, or you know, it, it kind of that's about where they're having as well. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's be, it, it'd be best if connections went down the handicap, and hopefully they will for you. Uh, so that's John there. With Blue Lord. Yeah, Blue Lord in the county hurdle is John's fancy uh, in the uh, handicap, uh, well, the best handicapped horse in his opinion at Jolton. Uh, mine would not necessarily be the best handicapped, but again, mine is just basically on price. Um, if you um, remember last season's uh, Johnny Henderson winner um, of Gordon Elliott's, um, <coughs> I'm a little, little perplexed as to why um, uh, Chosen Mate um, is 20 to 1 um, in anti post list. Well, it's 20 to 1 with Bet365. I think that absolutely needs smashing. I don't have a Bet365 account, so uh, no chance there. Um, but it won this race last year with any amount in hand after being with the handbrake on um, um, most of the season. They did, they did win at Gower and Park uh, prior to. Uh, Winning at Cheltenham, but it had the handbrake on for the for the other starts. The six to four favourite at Fairy House was a disgrace, by the way. Last season in one of the preps from David Russell, I've never seen anything. I've never seen a favourite with the handbrake on as much as that. Um, and he he duly bolted up last. If you anyone, if you watch the run, he got the last wrong, and it's still where he is pricked, and and it, and it's eight pounds higher. It's basically had uh, four runs this term. One was over hurdles, which which it was off, but obviously back over hurdles in a good race. Um, you know, it wasn't entitled to win. Um, and then three, again, more spins over fences. It's exactly, it's a very similar prep. Um, Dana Russell won't be riding, obviously, because he's injured. But um, if Keith Donahue takes the ride or whoever whoever they get to take the ride, I'm sure they'll, they'll do well. But bearing in mind, John, it went, chosen mate went off as a very heavily backed uh, seven to two favourite for this race last year, yeah. it's now twenties, and there's there's nothing there's nothing changed. It, it literally it's in good heart. You saw that from the hurdles yeah. run yeah. on the reappearance, and then it's had three spins again. So, it, it I mean, why is it twenties? It's remarkable. Um, eight pounds high. It, it had won it had won the race last year with eight pounds more. In fact, if you stop the video tape two out. You'd, you'd have said this thing is just it's travelling like the wrath of God. It was just like everything else is under the pump, and, and Dave is just absolutely sat motionless. So eight, eight pounds, I don't think is gonna gonna be the be all and end all. So twenty to one chosen mate uh, is absolutely ginormous. No chance that that's twenty to one on the day. None, zero. Um, so that would be my. Uh, I remember. It, I remember it winning last year. You could maybe. I, I was, yeah, I was with you. Cry of anguish from the cemetery as Johnny Henderson started spinning. Really. If, you re- if you remember, John, we, we, weren't we, we were at a golf club. I'm sure we were that day. I think we were, yeah, yeah. And we watched it. Yeah, we watched it in there. And 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 I, and I, yeah, he, well, I said it, it, it was just it was just oof, it was easy. Anyway, it was, to, to win a big, you know, big handicap like that as easy as that. I was, the lap was on the cemetery, wasn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, it is going to be tougher, a year older, uh, you know, an £8 iron mark. I'm not saying it's going to be a cakewalk, but as I said, it, for my, so I'm not saying this is like thrown in or anything now, but how can it be 20 to 1? It just can't be. It's just, just impossible. Uh, yeah. So, so that'd be that'd be my choice of all the handicaps uh, so far. So good question, Dean. So it's Blue Lord for John County Hurdle and uh, chosen mate for me uh, in the uh, uh, Johnny Anderson uh, 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 chase. Uh, right onto the uh, racing this weekend. Uh, it's certainly decent fare. Um, obviously, it's uh, wet, wetting your whistle for for the, the Cheltenham Festival. Um, uh, in two weeks, and we've got Kempton, uh, Newcastle, where there's the Ida Chase, uh, and Lingfield, where you've got the uh, Winter Derby, uh, and a decent little listed sprint there on Saturday. So we'll we'll start on the flat, get the flat out of the way, John. Uh, the first race there is the uh, it's the two or five. It's the Betway Heaver Sprint Stakes, a listed contest where we've got the favourite Mosgill at six to five. Any opinion in this, John? Yeah, I mean, Mosque Hill really looks fairly solid, I would have thought. Um, I mean, we've got a new trainer there, haven't we? Uh, young Bethel. Um, looking to get off to a flyer. Uh, I mean, the thing, the thing is, the uh, the Marley crew have loads of winners, don't they? Yeah. I mean, Marvellous operation, Tom Marley and the, the gang. Um, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's on my first boat, Tom, you know, and it's like, it seems like there's two a week. <laughs> you know? I know. And uh, considering what he's working with, he does fantastic. And uh, it wouldn't be the biggest shock if one of his popped up, really. Um but I, I don't think Moss Gill's going to be hard to pay either if it comes in any sort of form. Uh, um, it, it's, it's a very boring selection. I know it's six to five, but I'd, uh, I'd be struggling to uh, look past it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's an interesting setup, really. You, you've got a, a couple of absolute speedballs in Lord Ridiford and Ornate. And um, both of these, you know, go hell for leather. And you'd like to think it just sets up something, sets it sets it up nice for something taking a lead. Uh, and obviously, your horses that take a lead, the likes of uh, Royal Birth, uh, Blue de Vega, Rocket Action, and Moss Gill. And like like you point, like you rightly point out, uh, Moss Gill. If the real Moss Gill t- turns up, it's it's very difficult to envisage defeat. Uh, a defeat of Al Rea at York last July is absolutely a league above these. Um, then third, obviously, in the Nunthorpe. Um, and only thing that I would say, and I, I don't know, I don't know what went wrong afterwards, but I, I actually backed him at Doncaster, um, it, and he was weak in the market, uh, which I was surprised at, given he'd just finished third in a Nunthorpe. Yeah. Um, it was very easy to back, and he was he's quite disappointed. Um, Finishing six, he was sort of beat two out, um, and I thought that's that's a bit too bad to be true. And he followed that up with another sort of uh, moderate effort at Nottingham, and kind of kind of just uh, I, I don't know where we are with him. It's it's one of them. It, if the real Mosgill turns up, that's what you're betting on, really. If yeah. Mosgill just turns up, he wins. So that's, yeah, I mean that's... the Doncaster race. I thought maybe just prominent enough there, you know, and. The quarter goal went fast enough, and uh, I mean the first and the second were both both came from the the back really. I mean uh, the winner missed the kick. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if it just went a little bit quicker, Danny. Um, you know, I don't like making excuses for horses as a rule, but uh, no, because uh, I mean. I mean, Moss, Moss, yeah, because Moss Gill beat. Um, uh, so obviously, Tarbush has come from back, like you say. Um, and Moss Gill, prior to that, at York in the in the city walls, beat beat Tar. Tarbush was fourth, um, beating about that three quarters of a length. Um, so Moss Gill there. So, like you say, it could be that you might be right. Um, 
certainly gets the right setup here with 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 the pace anyway um, to sort of track and do its own thing. Um, shouldn't be any problem either with the uh, with the surface. You wouldn't have thought uh, Linkfield. Um, obviously, it's never never ran here on the all weather. Um, you know, it's uh, which sometimes can be a bit of a bit of a negative because it's it's the fastest of the all weather tracks, and certainly. It's the... Do you think it's getting less of an issue with that play now with so many training centres having the all weather trips and? Probably, possibly, probably, yeah. It's probably me sort of like you know wanting. It, yeah. it used to be a big thing, I thought, when you were on the first run of the hour, because chances are they wouldn't have seen it at home, even, you know. But I, I think now that so many training centres have all weather strips, and a lot of the training's done on them, because, well, they're so supportive, they're less, less likely to break arses down, aren't they, you know? And, uh, yeah. Um, I think there's an awful lot go there more clued up now. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, you're probably right there. It's probably me wanting butter on my toast and, and jam and everything. Um, but yeah, like I said, the real Moskill turns up, he, he wins that. And that's you decide. It's, I think it's up to the punter to decide whether six to five, five to four is fair or not. Uh, like I say, pace scenario should be perfect. Um, it's, it's got a nice draw in four. It's just he, he can, so PJ can be able to just slot him in the middle of the pack and then. He can move left or right, whichever way he wants to go, preferably right at Linkfield. Never like the inside rail there on in the straight, but um but yeah, it gives you options. Uh so yeah, uh, it's hard to argue really with Moskill. We move on to the winter derby. Um that's the two forty race. Um only five go to purse. Possibly a shade disappointing in terms of field size for for what is a, a, a it's, you know it's absolutely filthy this, isn't it, considering yeah. that you had all the prize money zealots banging on about this. Yeah. Uh, for God knows how long. You give them a chance to run for 30 days and there's five of them to turn up. Yeah, it's, dis- it's disappointing. I agree, John. Um, yeah. It was time and time again. And you'll still see people like the screaming kilt. will be saying the biggest issue of racing is it's prize money. And I mean, it's not. It, a bigger issue than the prize money is the lack of people willing to turn out for decent prize money. Yeah, so not, it's quite a nice pot given the times. Um, you know, th- there'll be a lot of Group Threes certainly this summer that will be le- be worth less than fifty five thousand guaranteed. Um, it's it's not a bad effort, really. No, I think I really sorry for them. Actually, this is this is what they've got turning out. You know. Um, yeah. I think it's a trying shame. I mean, the, the whole our weather thing during the winter needs a bit of attention, I think. You know, I mean, because we saw how fast about it, you know. Um, mm. and, I mean, there's still loads of yards shut down, isn't there, you know? And with more of our weather racing coming on line, I mean, really, there's no business shutting down like they do, you know, because, I mean, these trainers with hundred and other horses and that, you know, I mean, they should be looking for opportunities 12 months of the year. Yeah, no, I concur. Um, the race itself, uh, have you got a, a particular fancy at the prices or yeah. they've got Father of Jazz, the six to four favourite? You, you got a... Definitely wasn't going to back that. I mean, um, for me, it's done nothing on the clock to suggest. It should be six to four favourite in a race like this. Um, all right, it, it looks progressive, but I think it's got its approach. It's not run this far either. Um, I think Johnny Drama going back up in trip with the uh, old misery gut riding, I think uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's probably the, the, the one I'd be playing at 13 to 2. I think it's quite an attractive price, really. I mean, he's a uh, He's, he's the top unofficial ratings in this. He's rated 109, the favourite's rated 101. They're running off levels. He got 64 against 13 to 2. Yeah. I don't really know how you can back the 64 pull. No, it's, in, it's interesting you say that because uh, Johnny Drama is 13 to 2 and he's the highest rated horse in the field at 109. Uh, this is a handicap. He's giving the favourite £8. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, like you say, 13 to 2 and 6 to 4. I've got to concede, Father of Jazz, uh, I've looked at some sectional timing data and Father of Jazz has done some pretty serious sectionals in terms of, you know, he's good. In fact, uh, before his last handicap, I stated he was a 100 horse. Well, that, but, but as we know now, he is a 100 horse and he's also taking on horses that are rated higher. So six to four, does it make any appeal? Not, to, not to me or you, I don't think. No. Um, I mean, I, I, I've heard that. I mean, I'm pretty sure it is because I've read it anyway. But Forrester Dean, I think, is a lead horse at, at Goslands. I know, I know, it used to lead up in Abel, um, yeah. in Gallops. Um, I'm never, never keen on lead horses really because I always think that they're always waiting to be passed. If you know what I mean, they kind of get trained a certain way and. And it's, I think, it's I think if, they drop in once a year, don't they? When it's an easy race and they get a soft lady, usually. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. So, like, I'm, I'm never keen to support like, like horses like that. Forest of the, it can win, you know, because basically, again, we could be faced with a tactical affair where Forest of Dean, I think, is more or less certain to, to go on and, and make the running. Um, so, I, I wouldn't. I'm not saying it's a negative, but. Like you say, it could be one of those times where they just all leave Forest the Dean and 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 that goes and makes all, because uh, I can't see it hardly any pace in the race at all. Um, but I'm I'm with you, John. At, at, at the prices, it would be Johnny Drama. I I, I do like Felix, but again, he's going to be uh, held up uh, last by Holly. He um, proper gallop, couldn't he? Yeah, he's going to need the proper gallop to win. Um, and whether he gets that, he's open to question. But it's a tactical affair. Father of Jazz makes very little appeal at the prices, um, basically because I think he's got to step forward again to win. Uh, he might do. Felix as well. I, I wouldn't say it's a gimme that he wants this trip. I no. think he probably just wants a bit more luck at 10 furlongs. I think that's it, really. Um, I mean, last time he, he gave Bangkok uh, a couple of length start and was no for, not really much further away at the line. Um, and, and I think I think that brings him right into this. I think yeah. that's the best that's the best form in the race. But mm. as I said, you you definitely need luck in running with pace, etc. And it's not one I can really get involved with from a play, pre-play aspect. Though I, I I would be taking on the favourite at six to four. I think blind at that price because I just don't think it's any value. Mm. Right, summed up nicely there. Uh, so uh, John's with Balding. Uh, I'm sort of with Balding. But a, a tappy sort of affair. Uh, we move on to the uh, jumps action, and uh, Kempton's put, got a nice card um, the, uh, at Saturday afternoon. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is the uh, 150 race. That's the Close Brothers Pendle uh, Novice Chase. It's a Grade Two affair. Not many runners, but quite intriguing. Um, certainly got uh, three runners, probably with 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 a, with a shout. John, did you have any view in this? Um, I, I was kind of fascinated, really, why Hendo was running this son of Gamas against Ace. Um, there's nothing to be gained in running in this, is there, really? No. You know, I mean, if he runs well and he finishes on the hills, he's going up. I can't, uh, I can't really get my head around why he's running it. Um, Unless he thinks it's a lot better than what we've seen. I mean, I, I know he's had a wind up, didn't it? But uh, that doesn't seem to have worked the article. Uh, and really, I, I, I just thought the pumpkin head house down the bottom just looked fairly solid, you know? Um, yeah. uh, as I say, the, the, the one I'll be watching, I, I won't be having a bet in the race. The one I'll be watching would be Son of Camas, just to see what the hell he's playing at, you know. Uh, just, just, just wondering if it's like ground, maybe, because obviously Kemp's tomorrow. Yeah. Probably one of the best drying tracks around, and, and it's already good. It, who knows, it might even be quicksider good tomorrow, given that they've had fairly warm temperatures or something. Um, I mean, it's running some fairly, fairly sticky stuff this year, hasn't it, uh, to be fair? Yeah. Um, it could be that. Um, I mean, it's, it's 14 to 1, isn't it? I mean, I don't think I'm even tempted at that price, but I'm curious to see how it runs. Well, absolutely. I mean, o- over hurdles, it, it, it did beat King Rowland, um, you know, and that would be 
that would be a 140 horse for sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, maybe not as forlorn as what we think because, I mean, according to official ratings, the, the top rated is uh, Gar Law, 150. Well, not a lot to find um, if, if, if that could run its best. So, like you say, it's an intriguing uh, horse to look at at that sort of price. Um, I really struggled here, if I'm honest, because you've got Cole Cody that's, that's basically going to make the running. For, for back to layers, I think... I think you can literally empty the till at sort of around the uh, uh, six, seven to one mark because this this horse will bomb off in front like he's been doing at Cheltenham, mm. um, and th- that's that's your edge. You, you've you've probably got two ticks for nothing, um, two points for nothing in the bank if you were to back Cool Cody. I think as a as an in, uh, as a pre player then to lay out in running uh, a free two pointer if you like. That'd be my angle in here. Um, as as for the uh, the market leaders, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's the right it's the, the right prices. I think that's the thing we, we bet for value, and you know, we want to be on something that we can say, yes, this is this is genuine sort of value. Um, I can't really say I've I've got any value selections in here other than the angle on Cole Cody. So that's where I'm going. It's pretty boring, I think, but. That's, that's when, when, when you're on the on the, the cusp of Cheltenham, you, you don't want to be having eleven hundred quid to win a JD on this map. No, nah, not not really. Um, I mean, I mean the other thing with this favourite as well. If I if I'm going to be nitpicky, is that the Wing Canton race it won quite impressively, wasn't a particular fast time. Mm. Um, and and secondly, uh, the horse it beat Golden Type and wouldn't be much. Um, you know, and then it's obviously finished second to a. To an impressive shishkin, uh, it, it's, it's look that that's that's good form in its own right, really. Uh, Thirteen lengths behind, probably the Arkle. Uh, the, I'm not saying winner, but it, it'll be sort of it, up there in the Arkle. He's, he's probably good enough to win this. Um, but so I'm not going to knock it. But uh, like you say, at the prices, I think we can. Uh, I think we can move on, and hopefully uh, there's, there's better to come from us. Which uh, I th- I, we've got. Me and John have got some good bets, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we can beat that. Right, the next race we're going to look at is the uh, two twenty five race. That's the uh, Close Brothers Adonis Juvenile Hurdle, a Grade Two event, and Tritonic is the strong six to five favourite. John, yeah, uh, yeah, I think we've got another problem here, haven't we? Really, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, it, you know, I mean, it, it humped them, didn't it, really, at Ascot? I mean, it was never going to get paid. Um, it did very well to win, yeah. You know, um, it just always looked as though it was going to get there to me. And yeah. I think with its flat rating as well, you know, I mean, it's... It's it's gonna kind of not a minimum one for fair, I think, isn't it? You know what I mean? And you know, I mean that's beyond most of these, I would have said. Yeah. I'm I'm I mean Ascot, um Tritonic uh, caught Casalupi in the closing stages. And the the thing is with Ascot, as I've remarked on recently, is that Ascot definitely suits front end. Um, without a doubt at the moment. He's a tight track. If something gets loose on the lead like Casalupi did, jump him well. And don't, I'm not taking anything away from Casalupi. He jumped fantastic. It was a pleasure to watch it, actually. I, I thought it was really good mm-hmm. for a hurdling mm-hmm. depth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, really game. Re- I really enjoyed watching it. And I, I wish it well tomorrow. But I just can't see on this track, which doesn't suit the front end, despite what people might think. think oh, Kempton's quite sharp. It is. But it's they tend to go a bit quicker around here for that reason. You know, you always seem to get decent gallops at Kempton. Very rarely do do horses seem to crawl uh, at Kempton, and I, and, I, and I do think that just just plays plays in the hands a bit of horses ridden more patiently. And I think you'll see a different result today with Tritonic and Casalupe. I think Tritonic will will beat Casalupe rather comfortably. And like you said, with the flat engine, I love the horse on the flat. Uh, the ground will be no problem. Um, the, the quicker ground, absolutely no problem whatsoever, um, and it's got a proper engine in this. Uh, I mean, not again, no disrespect to Casalupi, but if this were a flat race, Tritonic could be giving Casalupi two stone plus. So it, it it literally is for me Tritonics to lose, and I don't think six to five is too bad. I think if 
if you give me six to five about this or ten to eleven about that favourite in the uh, in the pendle, um, I'm taking six to five. This, uh, you know, I don't yeah. know what you what you. I would agree with that. I think this is a much more solid proposition, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting uh, debutant from Dan Skelton, John Locke. That was uh, decent on the flat, about 85. Sullivan Bloodstock have bought that. Um, but, again, that that wouldn't live with Tritonic on the flat either. No. Um, so, I just think this is, a, this, is a, this is a case of, as long as Tritonic does things right, I think, I think he wins. So, again, apologies for being boring, but we had the same problem as the race before. So, But we do think Tritonic would be a better bet at 6-5 to five than the Pendle runner at 10-11. to 11. And as I said, I do like Tritonic's chances quite strongly. OK, we'll move on. The 3 o'clock Kempton, that's the uh, Skybet Dovecut Novices Hurdle. It's a Grade 2 event. And f- heading the market at 2 to 1 is the Paul Nichols trained at Hall Street. John, any of you here? Yeah, we've almost got our listener uh, four trebles in a row, apparently. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I kind of made this between the top two. Um Athol Street and uh, Calico. Now, Athol Street, um, the two wins around Taunton. I don't think quite add up to trumping the win of Calico around Ludlow myself. Yeah. I, thought, I thought that was a right nice performance. And I think the 3 to 1 against 15 to 8. I think I'd rather go with the one with it. Well, I think a slightly more potential still in the locker. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Taunton Farm as a rule. Um, whereas I, I think sometimes you can get quite a nice race at Ludlow. And uh, I thought that race was all right, the Calico one. And uh, yeah, I, I think three to one is very fair. Yeah, I mean Calico when he when he won at Ludlow was be, a jockey was sat motionless from sort of three out right to the line really did didn't have a race. One thing would concern me with Calico, and I'm I'm pretty unless that's his racing style, I'm pretty sure at some point they'll go with a wind up with this because the head was up a bit uh, on the running, um, which usually suggests that they might just have a little bit of difficulty with the wind. You know that that's the general trait sometimes with horses with the head in the air. Yeah. And um, but the, there's no doubt doubt in his class. Um, um, that, like, that, was, that was heavy ground as well, you know. I mean, that yes. accelerates any windy shows, doesn't it? You know. Um, it, it could, it, I agree with you, John. It could really improve um, yes. considerably. Um, but what I would say is um, that Athol Street uh, won. Uh, uh, I thought uh, a, a poorish race, really. Um, at Taunton um, I did feel that uh, there was a few not off here for example the second horse heart of a line of Manus weren't, wasn't off at all mm-hmm. um, and I, I would I would see it as uh, a race that sort of fell in for the horse really um, and yeah. I think 15 to 8 it's very very poor value indeed I, I really stress this I, I wouldn't even have it favourite in fact my, my favourite and second favourite I'm going to oppose you with a selection in this with Kate Gentleman, um, the, em- the Emmett Mullins runner. Uh, this horse won the um, the Irish says um, at the Curra on the flat. Um, it's it, it's a class act. It's basically got a, a good cruising speed. It was very impressive at Punchestown Town uh, over hurdles uh, before bombing out in the Grade One over two six at Leopard's Town at the Dublin. Um, I think because they're bringing it out quickly. They might, have, they might have found a problem here. It's by Champs Elysee and a Galileo Dam sire, so you, you're fine for the ground. Um, you know, it, it'll, it'll enjoy the ground. The best jockey in the race, John Joe O'Neill Jr. And I, I just think Cape Gentleman is is the one to be on it. It'd be my second best bet of the weekend, but I, I do agree with you. I do respect Calico, um, but that's how I'd have the betting. I'd have Cape yeah. Gentleman as, as favourite. I'd have Calico second in. And I'd, I'd have Athol Street probably around the centre two mark. That's how confident I am that Athol Street shouldn't be favourite. Mm-hmm. 
So I think we agree on that. It's the yeah. wrong fab. Yeah. So, yeah, so punters there, I think we're steering you away from the fab in that. Um, obviously, uh, whatever you decide in that, we're against that, at, uh, certainly at 15 to 8. Our, our, our listener will be on the phone taking as much 15 to 8 as he can get now, won't Absolutely, he? absolutely. So that, 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 that's basically cause for you to go out now and have, and have an absolute fortune on Athol Street to win that tomorrow, <laughs> as the law of sod applies. But anyway, as, on, a, on a professional capacity, if I'm playing tomorrow, and that's around the two to one mark, I'm laying that tomorrow for plenty. So you'll know you'll know my mood after that race if if that bolts up after. Uh, if I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be laying that. Uh, Three thirty five race at Kempton. It's the uh, final race uh, we're covering there, uh, and it's the uh, what used to be the Racing Post Trophy, the Close Brothers Handicap Chase, um, Grade Three event, and. A clear favourite at the moment would be Al Dancer of the Twist and Davis Yard heading the market at 15 to 2. John, have you uh, got a selection in this? Yeah, um, I mean, it's taken an absolute nosedive this race, hasn't it, compared to what it was? Yeah. I mean, didn't Desert Orchid win this at some point? Desert Orchid has won this race, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, take God. Dreadful stuff. Um, but as again, it, it it perfectly illustrates the focus being on the festival, doesn't it? You know, I mean, you, you wouldn't have any of these on your mind for Cheltenham, uh, really. Uh, well, I, I picked two out. Um, I picked out Slate House, who was having his second run after the wind up, and the Tizard Stable is probably in marginally better form now than it has been. For the other part of the season, really. Yeah. Um, there's some back form there with um, that thing of Tom George's unboxing there last year uh, that would give it a, a fair old chance in this. Um, I'm just trying to think of what that Tom George did. Black, black Op. Yeah. It, it was Boxing Day 2019, I'm not saying last year but it's the year before and, um, I think that does put the arse right in here you know I mean it came out of that race with a rating of uh, 156 we offer 148 here um, so you know I mean there is a case to be made for saying it's, it's quite well handicapped uh, as I say the Tizard yards have been dead really all year and it the, the showing signs are stirring into life now. Um, yeah. So hopefully that'll run well for them. Um, the other one I liked um, is Talk is Cheap, uh, Alan King's ass. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, I'll just sort of watch this one's progress back from injury with, with interest, really. Um, he. Uh, he hasn't overfaced this, I don't think. Um, he took his time with his other. And I, it, it, it's probably not the sort of race to highlight a racing post trophy winner, but I thought it ran really well last time out on the old weather over two miles. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it looked like Arthur was really coming to itself, I thought. And while it's still £10 higher than when it won the Whitbread. I mean, when it did win the Whitbread, I think they were sort of quite excited by this horse and thought they got something that was going to go on and probably develop into a Gold Cup horse. Um, now, obviously, that's all gone down the crap already because he, he's had this problem. But uh, I think there's still time for this horse to knock another big handicap off now whether it's here or whether it's maybe even at Liverpool later in the season I don't know but I don't think it's us it's made significant strides since it came back and I would not be surprised to say this run really really well tomorrow Interesting John, an interesting selection for sure um, I'm going to wimp out here and offer nothing um, which is kind of what I've done on this podcast, um, <laughs> but 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 um, but for you stats buffs, uh, I thought I'd just run this past you that it's quite an interesting stat because 
I think the logic applies here that 13 of the last 14 winners of this race have been seven to nine year olds, and quite a few elder statesmen have tried to win this. And the, I've got a, the logic, the theory. I'm, I don't follow just stats blind because stats can mislead you down wrong, dark, dangerous paths. Uh, however, this one has a certain credence of logic in that. Um, Kempton's a fast track, as we know. We can see how you see how fast they, they jump fences at Kempton. It's it's basically you've seen how like brutal King George can be, and I think some of these old old deers just just tend to struggle with for pace, if you know what I mean. And and I think once you get on the back foot at Kempton, when you're jumping, um, it, it's very difficult to make the ground back up um, on, on the chase course. You know, it literally is. It's, it's obviously on the inside of the hurdles track. It's it's all it's all it's quick, and and I, and I think that 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 sort of adds up really that you need a handicapper that's still got four legs, four wheels, and you know, and I, I, that's that's what I believe. So I think that stat bears up. So seven to nine year olds. So if uh, well, if you like your stat, sorry, John, that's got rid of six of them. Well, there you go. Six. That, that, that's narrowed the field by six. I mean, amazing there from me. Um, but yeah, that's all I'm offering on the race. Um, we move on to the final race we're previewing uh, before we get on to our other business because I haven't given mine up yet. And I, I don't know. I think John John might have a decent bet for you. Um, it's the uh, Vertem Ida handicap chase at Newcastle, the 315. Uh, an absolute slugfest. Uh, of an event, um, it's not. It's usually very unpleasant on the eye when the going's quite testing. The, the ground is drying out a little. I don't know if that's going to help them or not. Uh, John, have you any views on the Ida? I don't think it helps some of these very much because some of these are absolute swines, aren't they? Um, there's more tongue ties and cheek pieces than you'd find at a gimp festival. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I hate these races. I really do. I mean, you're talking sour old chesses that don't want to know after a mile, most of them. <laughs> they, they're getting the living Jesus booted out of them when they go around the clubhouse town for the first time and they're all trying to duck back into the stables and that. You know, it's horrendous stuff, really. Yeah. Uh, in spite of that, um, <laughs> I felt as though I managed to get it down to three. Um, I thought crossly tender. Um, there was no savage equipment on this. There was no cheap paces, blinkers, hoods, twitch. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and probably looks as though it might be quite suited to this sort of trip. Uh, certainly one of these that hasn't really had the, the gumption knocked out of him yet, unlike some of these. So I, I think it, it, it'll keep going. Um, I, I, I did like Strong Economy, but of course they've done the usual stupid thing here, haven't they? They've, they've applied the cheek paces because he didn't travel brilliant last time and only got on top of the finish. So they're going up in trip, they're going to travel more, he'll go more in the jockey's hands and he'll empty out quicker. Yeah. You know. <laughs> um, yeah. So that put me off that, you, you know, I mean, if you're going up in trip, the last thing you want to do is hear how travelling better, you know what I mean? Um, if you're happy with his finishing effort, just leave him alone, you know, until you need him to travel. Um won't need to travel against these for half and we'll return it in after the lap. Um, <laughs> Cross Park is probably solid each way as well because there's, there's no accoutrements being fitted there either. And no, more seconds of Jimmy White as well. Well, yeah, I mean, you'll just be on the premises, won't it? And then something will just prove that bit tougher after the last. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, Crossley Tender, I think that's probably the one to be on, you know? Yeah, it's fairly solid at the prices, Crossley. Um I'm, again, not putting up a selection here. I'll just keep in tune with the rest of the podcast, really. Um, I, I, I did like Sam's adventure, just for Brian's sake. Uh, I know he, he'd be more desperate than desperate Dan with a cow pie to win this. Um, and 
the, he, it's, it's, he's got the right horse. Sam's adventure definitely wants a, a stamina trip. And I think finally, this is exactly right up his street. And I just pray for Brian that, that he can land this. It, it'd be great for the stable. Um, he's, he's, he's not having amazing times at the moment. And I he just, I just, do with a winner, couldn't he? There's something like this. I mean, a, sa- a Saturday ITV winner of a big race, you know, I think, and he's got the right horse to do it with. It, I'm not saying it's value or anything. It's probably around five to one. And, you know, I, I can't be bothered with that, but it, it's, it, he's got the right horse, the right jockey as well. Definitely the right jockey for the horse. Um, in Henry Brook, and and yeah, so I'm I'm very very keen on the, for for Brian to win that with Sam's Adventure. So that's the racing covered off. We've now for our uh, uh, other bets. Uh, I've got a nap that goes back at Kempton in the 115. Um, Andrew Balding's Diocletian <laughs> uh, around, around the four to one mark. Have, have you got the same job? <laughs> We've done it. We've done the double max. We've done it. We're, we're here again. This this is an exclusive. See, it proves I don't speak to John beforehand because we right. We've done the last the last treble nap was uh, was dropped the anchor um, a couple of weeks back at a, a juicy ten to one. Well, we've got one here, Diocletian. I I know John is napping this with me. I can tell by his reaction. Uh, goes in one fifteen at Kempton, an hundred flat horse, basically that that's had settling issues. It, it basically can I say pissed up. At Faken and last time, um, how the handicap has not given it any more. It's given it nothing for luck, really, on the performance. Um, and I know Gunsight Ridge has got very strong form with Gowell Road at Newbury, which does stand up strong. Dia- Diocle- Gunsight Ridge cannot beat Diocletian if Diocletian does everything right and settles. Uh, do you agree with that, John? I, I, well, honestly, I mean, the pace of this ought to help him settle. I mean, I, I mean Andrew Bolding's a bigger asshole than his dad for you, was in these jockeys that nobody likes, uh, nobody wants to bet. Uh, so, I mean, she'd be a concern, um, despite her having a slightly average straight rate, you know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a straight rate, in all honesty. I, but... I, I think the soft dance suit will suit this. Yeah, I mean, as long as it settles. Otherwise, she'll, she'll end up grabbing him by the ears and he'll, he'll get his mouth over a bit and well, that'll yeah, be it. Yeah. Um, but I think at the price and off the handicap market, it's well worth a chance in that. Yeah. Uh, because they'll probably go quick and really, I'd, I'd, he, he should just hunt these, to be honest. There you have it, the bar steward's double nap. Have you any other business, John, elsewhere? Um, I, I, I did have uh, uh, one, one I wanted to mention. Um, uh, good old Brian, again at Newcastle, um, Forrest Behan. Ah, um, the hurdle. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether Brian must think it's lost its confidence over fences or what, I don't know. Um, but, I mean... He's got Oakley Brown on it, taking seven off. We've got a net yep. rating here of 136. Um, I mean, if he, if he can't win this on what ought to be fairly decent ground by tomorrow, um, the, they should be poking the church for the memorial service, shouldn't they? Yeah, it's interesting because, um, I, I mean, basically Brian has entered the horse at Cheltenham in the county hurdle. Yeah. Um, and he's also got an entry in the more battle hurdle at Kelso. So it's interesting that Brian's like, obviously shell fences. Hmm. And I, I don't know why. I mean, I've never really seen a lot wrong with it's jumping of fences. I mean, it's, it's jumped around some fairly tricky places over the years. Uh, yeah, it's just fell twice this season. I think I think they've just well, decided. The hurdles, though, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean, that was a total face plant over the hurdles. I couldn't. Uh, I wouldn't get over that. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was fairly strong on that one as a back to lay that day as well. Uh, never even got a chance to hit pink. He, he ballooned over the first, and I think it was first plant at the second. 
Um, but the, the rating is off there tomorrow. Well, if, if you can't win that, they've just got a major problem, haven't they, really? Yeah, I concur. I mean, I mean, nine to two, uh, seven, a free seven pound, uh, which 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 the kid is. Um, and like you say, the horse that beat Kalashnikov uh, at Aintree uh, uh, just over a year ago in the uh, old run chase. Um, yeah. I mean, really, I, I agree. I, I totally agree. I, I think I think I think that's that's got to go well. Um, obviously, I don't want to be knock the horse. It's seven from thirty-five, but can be a little bit jaded in a finish, um, which kind of off, 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 puts me off. Sometimes, but I think, uh, I, think if it, I think if it comes off the back of a a big effort, I think the the, the next time out in it, be really careful. Yeah, uh, I don't think you put a big big effort in for a while, so I think it'll be all right tomorrow. Okay, so we, we, we've got some good selections there. Uh, Forest Behan there for John. Um, the big bar stewards nap of Diocletian in the one fifteen at Kempton, and other mentions there in the uh, TV events. And I hope you all have a, a cracking uh, uh, Saturday's punting. Now, on to Sunday. Uh, we've got the Sunday sermon as usual. Um, uh, and we've got uh, a special guest. It's uh, one of our new bar stewards. And it's the, uh, and I- I'm told that she's a, a menopausal Francesca Camani. So that should make things lively on Sunday. We've got all the usual topics this week for debate um, together. Um, get your questions in on Twitter. And on the John's Facebook page, get any any questions. We love to answer them. It's, it's part of the show, and we want you to be as involved as possible. So that's all for us on this weekend preview. Uh, that's all from me and John, and we'll see you again, hopefully, on the Sunday Sermon uh, on Sunday evening. Bye for now.